it has to stop, it will stop, and because I take it in a historical context, when we look at all other systems of systematic oppression of human groups in the past, the, the groups of oppressed people uh, did unite, um, did rise against the system of oppression, and the system had to fall, and that is exactly what has to happen in India. Indian women across the board, regardless of caste, class, religion, etc., will have to unite and recognize they have a common cause and fight a system that is oppressive, fight a patriarchal system that is oppressive. And that will be the first time, the first step that we will take towards stopping female genocide. The thing is, you can ask the same question for any other kind of killing. For example, dowry matters. Uh, once the, the cash well dries up, when you cannot extract another car or a flat or five kgs of gold from the bride's parents, then why kill her? You can divorce, you can separate and say, I'm going to get another bride uh, from whom I shall extract more money. If, if that is what you really want, more money. But what gives you the right to kill her? What makes you think you have the right to kill her? It's because, as in the previous question it was pointed out, Indian society thinks of girls and women as personal property. It is like you own um, a, a piece of furniture. If I don't want the furniture, if it does not serve my need anymore, I can dump it in, in the rubbish uh, heap. I can hack it uh, to pieces, I can burn it down, and they do the same thing. Women and girls are actually treated like pieces of non-human property. Uh, the, the thing is, when women say laws cannot be enforced as a rationalization, that concerns me. Because you would not hear other people, uh, for example, uh, black people uh, in the United States saying, well, what's the use? Yes, we will get killed because we are black, because laws cannot be enforced. That, that is a sort of a hopelessness. And it is very important, that is why, for women to recognize that, that you cannot, it is you who cannot be giving the rope to the system. You're giving the leeway to the system when you say laws cannot. What you should be asking, what all of us should be asking is why can laws not be uh, enforced? I demand that laws be enforced and make the government and make the system accountable. And, and that is what we have to do. And I've heard it said many times by women, oh, it's not the patriarchy, it is not men who are doing it, it is women who are inflicting violence on themselves. Why? Well, in any system that becomes closed and hopeless, within the oppressed group, there emerges competition for survival. When women, when women start killing other women or girls, what we are seeing in India is a concentration camp response in the women. It is an indication of how bad the situation is. The, the link is there. One is the direct link. And that is um, something that we don't talk about, but we absolutely must start talking about, that the rate of uh, the, the child sex ratios for girls is uh, closest to normal in the poorest 20% of the population. But as um, the sections of society in India get more educated, they uh, have higher incomes and obviously they have more access to technology, the child sex ratio drops and this is what the 2011 census clearly shows
that it gets worse for the middle class, but it is worse, the child sex ratio is worse for the topmost 20% of the population. The, the thing is, any time there is a system of, of killing, there is there are newer technologies being developed. For example, in the United States, um, to make sex selection easier, to make it more affordable, to make it more reachable. So uh, capitalist systems, which are also patriarchal systems, see this as opportunism. Uh, there's one patriarchal system that is, um, that as you go up, that ha where as you get into the middle and upper classes, the, the power increases. And so what you see, the drop in child sex ratio, is the, the more powerful sections of the, the uh, patriarchal system exercising their, their power with, with more force, with more vengeance. And other associated patriarchal systems uh, joining in, benefiting from it. It is, uh, well, mentality is, a, I think, an overused word. We should say what it is, and this is misogyny. A sustained and targeted discrimination against a group that creates a a permissiveness that allows that that where the society gives itself permission to target that group and like I said before it is not poverty it is not the poorest sections that have the the uh, highest rates even for example in in Chennai where uh, a neighborhood uh, surveys were done they found that, that as the wealth of neighborhoods increased, dowry-related violence and dowry-related murders also increased. The, it, it is an exercise of power. It's an exercise of patriarchal power. And since wealth and education uh, gives more power to a patriarchal strata, it is those, those stratas that are educated, that are wealthier, that also have more power to perpetuate female genocide. When I first went to the United States and I came across um, the anti-abortion lobby and what a big issue it was, I was surprised. Uh, why would abortion be such a big issue here? Um, and as I talked to, to women, uh, the pro-choice women and other feminist women, there was something I uh, realized which I actually had never heard growing up in India, that it wasn't actually about abortion. It was about a woman's complete autonomy and right over her body, her sexuality, her sex, her reproduction. Her body is her territory. Nobody has any right over it. So it is not a question of um, uh, uh, whether, uh, just whether or not a woman has abortion. Even if there was a pregnancy forced on a woman, if um, she was forced to carry uh, a pregnancy to full term, that is a violation of of choice. If she wants to have an abortion and she's not um, permitted, uh, she's prevented by uh, her husband or family members or society at large, that is a violation of her body. And that is a concept in India that we never deal with. We are actually raised to believe that the family um, that we are born to and then the family that marries, uh, that a, a, a woman where when she marries a man, that the family that the man is from owns her body. So for example, um, the number of times I have heard women, friends, who, uh, Indian w women, who uh, are say at, uh, at a peak of their career, they've got married, there's a promotion in the wings or, or some project that is 
really important to them and they happen to get pregnant. But she does not want to have the baby at that point in time. Next thing you know, the husband, the in-laws, everybody starts pressurizing her. Oh no, you cannot have an abortion. This is our child. And she's put under so much mental trauma that she's just not permitted. That is a violation of choice. In the end, a woman's reproduction, her body, it's, it is a biological function. When you begin to control it, all the abortions, the, the female fetal uh, abortions, I have never heard a woman say, well, I want to have a son and I don't want to have daughters and her husband and uh, in-laws are saying, no, 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 but we want to have a girl. You cannot abort this girl because we really want a girl. The, the, everything is so preset, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the pressure is so um, intense on women uh, that it does not that there are women whose personalities are such that psychologically they just give up right at the start where they say you cannot you will not but there are many cases and over and over I've heard these cases more where women are when they don't want to have the abortion they are starved and the, this is middle class upper middle class homes very often, repeatedly, you hear the story that my husband suddenly kicked me off the bed in the middle of the night or pushed me down the stairs to, to, in, to force an abortion. She will have an accident and she will have an abortion. And the thing is, you hear of systematic torture. The other stories, where if you go into slums and villages, women say they, they are tired of having children, but if they try to uh, get you know, uh, go for birth control or get the tubes tied, they get beaten up. And you hear these kind of stories on both sides, women being forced to have children, women being forced to have abortions. And it is a form of systematic torture and control of women's bodies. It is true, it is happening in all strata, it is happening uh, across all groups now, in all states now. But the census data very clearly shows a pattern. And that is, as you grow, go towards the middle and upper classes, the rate of female gender side gets worse. It is worse for the topmost. So this is the question that we need to ask. Why are we not addressing the data that the census is showing. Why is it that all, all the NGOs and all the groups that work, they begin to focus on the poorer communities, thereby using poverty and illiteracy as a justification because it is not. We know it is not true. We know it is not poverty. We know it is not illiteracy. And I'll tell you why. Because most female activists in India or male activists, um, they come from the middle and upper classes. We have grown up witnessing this violence, but we are actually conditioned in the middle and upper classes to be more silent. In um, Just ask yourself, why is it that the media goes running to the slum and the, and the village where a woman says, my baby has been killed or, um, uh, you know, a bride is uh, burnt to death or, or killed in, in some particular way by, by hanging. And that is because people in slums and villages talk. They, they, when something happens, they are more open about it. Middle and upper class women, starting from childhood, they are conditioned by their mothers and grandmothers and aunts and women around them to shut up, to keep quiet, to, to actually hide it, you know, to protect the family name. The law almost is never implemented and that's because they have political patronage. Me Politicians and government realize it is a system uh, of men, for men, by men. And 
the women, female politicians that we have today understand that they are there to serve the men. It is a system for men. And um, till women change that, I know that there is an argument for the 33%, but this is exactly what we are going to see. We are going to see women of patriarchal families taking the, 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 the positions to serve to continue serving men and then when the female gender side continues they'll say oh look you've already got 33 percent women but see nothing is happening i i think the only time 33 percent women will be effective is when women in india develop a collective political presence a, poli poli a, a, a voters presence and we make a demand as 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 a group right is to safety to you have the right to live as a girl or a woman I never have to tell a male dominated society please don't kill me because I can be of use to you I must never ever justify my existence that way that is my right under the Constitution that is my right as a, a, a citizen of the world as a human being it's my global human right it is my right under the indian constitution